This week, the aftermath of the Confederate disaster. I have long said the rebels are running off fumes. It is beyond clear they have lost the war. They just don't realize it yet. But the victor isn't declared till both sides recognize it. So can the Union prove this nation will not break? Let's start this week with the politics. The State of the Union. And oh my god, it is boring. Lincoln covers everything from our representative in Egypt. Charles Hale has already taken over the post. But what is of interest is... In stating a single condition of peace, I mean simply to say that the war will cease on the part of the government. Whatever it shall have ceased on the part of those who began it. After leaving Congress, he nominates Simon P. Chase, his former treasurer, as Chief Justice, and is confirmed the same day. In classic Chase fashion, he's a brilliant choice and also an egotist. I will forgive Mr. Lincoln much for this. To be Chief Justice of the United States is more than to be President, in my estimation. He will be sworn in on the 15th. How much Lincoln wanted his old rival to head another branch is debatable. Some say any other choice would have been shot down by the Senate. I don't know how much I agree with this, but more studious men than I swear by it. Before getting to the meat and potatoes of the week, the potatoes being Sherman and the meat being Tennessee, let's have some color. North Carolina Rainbow Bluff. This will be a fitting callback to Noah's Ark because it involves water screwing humanity over. The USS Whale Sung with two other vessels steam up the Roanoke River. Whale Sung returns alone. Damn water mines. Left. Right, left, right, left. Sherman's march moves like lightning, and his cavalry is the tip of the bolt. Tecumseh believes his men have had enough rest, and therefore orders a hunt on Confederate cavalry commander Joseph Wheeler. Nighttime skirmishing proves indecisive, but at Waynesboro, Georgia, the two sides meet. Wheeler and his cavalry have entrenched themselves. They don't have the numbers, but the land should suffice. Kilpatrick, leading the mounted warriors of the Union, has faith in his men, and orders an assault. The assault is repulsed, the rebels fight fiercely off the first wave. Kilpatrick joins in the second and smashes the rebel center. The last obstacle has been removed. Next stop, Savannah. Rebellion will never be west of the Carolinas again. PGT Beauregard, who leads the west, writes to Davis defending his past decisions. The letter is pathetic. What even is more pathetic is his prediction that Sherman would be stopped from capturing any major cities. During the advance, Sherman comes across a young officer who had set off a torpedo as we know them, a landmine. His solution is cold. There had been no resistance at that point, nothing to give warning of danger, and the rebels had planted eight-inch shells in the road, with friction matches to explode them by being trodden on. This was not war, but murder, and it made me very angry. I immediately ordered a lot of rebel prisoners to be brought from the provost guard, armed with picks and spades, and made them march in close order along the road so as to explode their own torpedoes or to discover and dig them up. They begged hard, but I reiterated the order, and could hardly help laughing at their stepping so gingerly along the road, where it was supposed sunken torpedoes might explode at each step. But they found no other torpedoes till near Fort McAllister. This war is the first major use of landmines, and this solution will be used for a long time. If the Virginia Military Institute is the west point of the south, then the Citadel has a major chip on its shoulder. The Corps of Cadets won renown for their charge at New Market. It's time that Palmetto people proved their worth. At Tolfany Crossroads, the U.S. Marines battle teenagers. General John P. Hatch and his Coastal Division makes an amphibious landing to destroy rebel infrastructure. Opposing him is Major General Samuel Jones in the District of South Carolina. The battle has been mythologized quite a bit. The South Carolina cadets ambush a Union advance force, fall back to their defensive lines, repulse a charge with coordinated Enfield fire. The engagement ends as the Union line falls apart. The battle is significant not for what it is, but who fought it, the Marines and the Citadel's Corps of Cadets. But in all honesty, I don't think this battle matters. Turning to Tennessee, we see Hood's siege, no, encirclement, of Nashville continue. And this is a failure. The rebels need the Union to attack, and with no sign of action, Hood moves to further damage federal infrastructure. Forrest has been systematically removing the blockhouses. These defenses for the railroad were their top partisans, not a full enemy force especially not General Bates' infantry, which was sent to support Nathan. Together, they faced their first main opposition at Murfreesboro, a town seeing its third major battle. Opposing them is the infamous, opposing them is the infamous Major General Robert H. Milroy, sent out by Major General Lovell Rousseau. Gathering together 3,300 men, he strikes on Forrest's flank, breaking the rebels, capturing two cannons and 200 prisoners. 
Her own Buford's division breaks off from Forest Command and takes Murfreesboro, but are forced to retreat as they are unsupported. A great victory which Hood hopes Thomas will never know of. He continues to threaten the garrison, again trying to get the Union to attack, but Thomas won't even come to pressure from Washington. The nature is cold and terrible for battle. He has the initiative no matter where Hood is. His shipping is harassed but can't be stopped. Hood has lost already. Sickles time! He finally writes to Lincoln asking for a command. I beg respectfully to remind you that I am still unassigned. Spared the humiliation of being dropped from the rolls among the list of useless officers now under the resolution before Congress, relying on your justice. I beg to command my position to your kind consideration and remain, dear sir, your friend and servant, D. E. Sickles, Major General. That's where the week ends, and it seems Thomas has realized he has won. Grant believes George Henry to be a McClellan of sorts, a general always preparing for a battle they will never fight, but he isn't. He's an officer who is careful and doesn't make mistakes of his brash contemporaries. He know he has Hood dead to rights. The Confederates have lost all ability to be an opponent. They are barely an obstacle. He just needs to show it to Washington. Hi, it's Jonathan Teagan, the entire Civil War Week by Week team. I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. I know I did. I hope to see you next week as we continue this war to 1865 and through my final finals, at least for the series.